right, now, first of all, I guess we need to be very clear about what we mean by sand, right? And um, this is not a distinction that I use carefully with my language, but really, technically, sound doesn't refer to a wave. It refers to what our brains do once some wave energy um, kind of enters our body. Right? So sound is how our brains interpret some frequencies of longitudinal waves. So, if a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it, does it make a sound? No, it doesn't. It makes longitudinal waves, but if there's no ears and no brains, then there's no sound, right? Brain, uh, sound is something that our brains do. So no, if there's nobody there to hear it, no sound. Longitudinal waves, yes. Compressions and rarefactions, yes. No sound. Now, I, again, I am not going to be careful, though. I am going to use the term sound waves. Even though sound is internal to our brains, I'm still going to call them longitudinal waves that, that allow us to hear sound. I'm still going to call them sound waves. Uh, but really, truly, sound is, is in our brains. All right, so a couple of properties of you know, the sound that we're familiar with would be loudness. Loudness is not the same thing as the amplitude of the sound waves, but they are very related. Right? If we want to hear a louder sound, we do need um, higher amplitude longitudinal waves to reach our ears. Or at least we need more waves to reach our ears. Now, pitch, though, is exactly the same thing as frequency. Right? So the frequency of the longitudinal wave is synonymous with the pitch of the sound. Questions about either one of those? We don't have any other special names for sound besides loudness and pitch. We would still say wavelength, we would still say wave speed. All right, what we really want to make sure we have clear is how the heck do we make sound? How do we make longitudinal waves? So I have a few examples of sound producing things that we'll um, take a look at and then uh, you know, I have some, some real things as well, not, not just animated things. So here is a speaker, right? like speakers like you'd have in your cell phone, in the television, like in, um, you know, attached to your CD players, like whatever. Uh, so a here's like a kind of cutaway of a speaker. And there are some elements of the speaker that we don't really know anything about yet. So we can see little plus and minus signs here. What is that supposed to be? Yeah, electricity, right? In fact, alternating current, AC electricity. So we'll get to that later in the course, but we do need electricity to make this type of speaker work. And then we also, well, we have it labeled here. We also actually need magnets to make speakers work, and, and that's not something we get to in this course at all. But the sole purpose of the alternating current electricity and the magnet is to get the speaker to be vibrating, right? Moving up and down or in and out, depending on the orientation. So this whole diaphragm vibrates in and out, and when it vibrates out or up, that will push on the air adjacent to it. If it pushes on the air, what do you think that makes? A crest, a trough, a compression, or a rarefaction? If it pushes on the air above it. A compression, all right? It pushes on the air, forces the air molecules closer together, right, making a, high pressure, a higher pressure region in the, in the air. So it pushes up on the air, makes a compression, pulls back down, that would uh, cause a rarefaction, all right? So the speaker, vibrates up and down, alternately pushes and pulls on the air, makes our longitudinal waves. Uh, questions about that? Generally, a speaker will have multiple diaphragms, like larger ones and smaller ones. Uh, the larger ones will produ produce the lower pitch sounds, the bass, and the smaller ones will produce the higher pitch sounds, the treble. Ben? So, uh, Apple, like, earphones have magnets inside of them? Yes. That's absolutely correct. But they'd be pretty small because they just, they're already sitting right next to your ear, so they don't have to send as much energy into that air as a speaker that's on like the other side of the room or whatever. But yes, they would have uh, relatively small magnets inside them. All right, so here's another one which works the exact same way. All right, so here's a drum. And for a drum, right, we, we strike it, in this case with a drumstick, and that causes this drum head, right, it's a flexible, um, skin on top of the drum and causes it to, to vibrate. And let's see, what, which is the best way? Maybe this one's pretty good. When it vibrates up, it pushes on the air. When it vibrates down, it doesn't 
So we create a compression when it moves up, and then a rarefaction when it moves back down. Right, so it kind of works exactly the same way as a speaker. We just have a mechanical vibe when we have um, a stick striking it instead of alternating current and a magnet. Is this is the same kind of drum as that or no? Not that good. What is this called? I think it's a snare for turning. Snare? Yeah. 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 Alright. So if we want this drum head to vibrate, we just need to hit it. Up and down and vibrates for uh, this one didn't vibrate very long. That's probably why somebody put it out on the curb. Um, but it vibrates for, I don't know, half of a second. And then it's still vibrating a tiny bit, but most of the energy is gone uh, pretty quickly. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Anybody want to take a guess at the frequency of the waves that this is producing? How many times each second, if it even did it for a full second. How many times each second does this drum head vibrate up and down? Is it 10? Is it 100? Is it 1,000? Is it 1? Any guesses about what the frequency of these vibrations are? Anybody think 1? No, nah, that's, not, that's not high enough. 10? 100? 100 maybe we're starting to get close. Probably a few hundred. Uh, vibrations per second. Ah. Well, we, we will be able to quantify that. In fact, your third marking period project involves how many compressions and rarefactions can be produced by something in a second. Alright, so that was a drum. And then the final one that I have here, and uh, I meant to borrow Mr. Fusco's bell, but I forgot. Uh, the final one is a bell. Right? So the bell also vibrates. Uh, usually we'll have like a little ball inside that strikes the side and causes the whole outside of the bell to vibrate. And here we have a little blown up region where the blue, well, what are the blue things supposed to represent? It's supposed to represent air. Then they shouldn't be so close together, but whatever. Um, as the bell vibrates out, it pushes on the air molecules. That creates a compression. As it goes the other way, it doesn't push on the air. That will create a low pressure region. That's our rarefaction. Um, other questions at this point on our speaker, our drum, or our bell before we look at one other. Alright, so one of the questions on your last quiz involved something called a, a tuning fork. And there's a, a sketch of a tuning fork on the bottom. Let me grab a real one. Alright, so this is a, a tuning fork. I think they used to be used like maybe 30 years ago to like tune instruments. Right, but now we just like get a free app on our phone, and, and that is a lot easier than, than to use one of these. Um, but a tuning fork has like a handle, and it has these two arms, they're called tines, that stick off of it. And when we strike the tuning fork, the two arms vibrate, the two tines vibrate. Right? They move back and forth, they push and pull on the air. Um, it, let me not talk and do it again. I will walk this around, but I'm curious how many of you can hear it like from all the way up here. Raise your hand if you could hear it. Oh my gosh, almost all of them. Wow. Um, anybody know what note this one is? C. C, no. E. It's an E. Now, there are different pit, there are different frequencies that E can be. This particular one is 320 hertz. Right? So these times are vibrating back and forth 320 times every second. Right? That's pretty fast. That's pretty high, high frequency. Um, what I'd like to do is walk this around the room, right? put it next to your ear so you can hear it better, and then unless you tell me not to, I'm going to gently touch it against your ear so you can feel the vibrations. Right? Because it will be helpful to, to hear and feel it. All right? So I'm going to walk this around. If you don't want me to touch it against your ear, just tell me when I get to you. Curious if the camera can pick up on the vibrations. We'll find out.
So it definitely vibrates, right? You can hear it, you can feel it. Um, and we will be using these uh, in, oh, a lab, maybe next class, maybe the class after that. All right, any other questions about, about this thing? So the next thing we want to talk about briefly is uh, speed, right? So there's something called, like, the speed of sound. In fact, I think on your equation sheet, I have a speed of sound on there, right? All right. So as a, as a general rule, and as a pretty good rule, uh, the denser the medium that the sound is going to travel in, the faster that those compressions and rarefactions will propagate through the material. And I think that kind of makes sense, right? If we have, like, air molecule, air molecules are super far apart. I mean, that's, that's one of the properties of a gas. There's a huge space in between individual molecules. So if this tuning fork, right, strikes this air molecule here, that air molecule needs to travel pretty far before it hits the next one. Um, so that, that's going to happen relatively slowly. If we shove the tuning fork in water, right? In water, the, the water molecules are practically on top of, they are on top of each other. Right? They're barely further apart than they are in a solid. So if the, we shove the tuning fork in there, it's going to hit the water molecule. The water molecule, you know, nearly immediately hits the next one. So the denser the medium, the quicker that energy can, can propagate um, through it. So there was a movie I remember watching uh, where, where this played a role in one of the scenes. Uh, what movie is it? Is it recent? Recent, not really, 80s, late 80s, late 80s. <laughs> late, late 80s. <laughs> which one is it, Magna, which one? You guys aren't good with movies either? Oh, I agree. Yeah. Uh, Alright, so yeah, Ben apparently has seen this. So there's a movie called Stand By Me. Uh, who, anybody seen that? You don't know yet. So the movie is about uh, four, I think it's four boys, and I think they're about to start high school, so just a little bit younger than you guys. And it's like the 1950s, so there's not much to do. Um, and they hear about a dead body, like oh, on the river. And they spend like two days walking through like the woods and like junkyards and stuff to try and find this uh, this body. Um, and one scene, right? They get to like a river, but there's like a big cliff, right? So they can't just like walk down there. Um, but they find uh, a bridge. The the river is actually way wider than this. And what kind of bridge was it? So some of you say now that you've seen this, what kind of bridge was it? What? It was like a, it was like a, a railroad bridge. All right. So, and there, there were four of them, and this was quite, quite long. Um, and unfortunately, there was like, like kind of like a, a hill or a mountain or something, and the train track kind of came around the mountain, so they couldn't see very far, and they were a little scared to walk across it because if the train came and they were walking across it, there was kind of nowhere, nowhere to go. Right? On, on railroad bridges, there's no like shoulder, there's no sidewalk next to it. Uh, so they were a little, a little scared because they couldn't see back very far. So what, what, the one, what did the smarter kid do? Yeah, Jack. Did he put his ear to the track? Right, so he put his ear up against the metal railroad top. Not, not the top, the metal rail, railroad rail. Um, which was kind of smart because the sound travels faster in that metal rail than it does in the gaseous air. And, and not only does it travel faster, it kind of loses a little less energy. It kind of stays louder um, for a longer time. So yeah, he put his ear, ear against there. He didn't hear anything. They walked across. But then, you know, of course, for like dramatic effect, when they got like over here, the train, of course, came. Um, <laughs> but that was pretty smart, right? Because the sound does travel faster on the metal. Questions about that? Yeah. Not like the body or yeah, they did. And then some kids show up too, like at night. Like, oh, well, yeah, the older kids showed up, and then um, I don't. Yeah, there's something with that. I think it was like gone. It was like, it was like, wow. um, yeah, but whatever. That 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 wasn't the physics intensive part. Now, I can think of another example of sound not so much traveling faster, but tra traveling differently in a more dense medium. Um, can you hear things underwater? 
Yeah. yeah? I can hear things kind of really well under well underwater. Uh, not so much like speech, but like noises. So let me give you a, a, another small piece of homework um, for, for the weekend. Uh, stick your, like at least an ear, um, underwater, you know, sink, bathtub, whatever, and then like crack a knuckle. It's going to be ridiculously loud. It's going to be ridiculously loud if you crack the knuckle underwater and you have an ear underwater. Um, so give that a shot because the sound travels faster and it does um, end up keeping some more energy. It doesn't spread out quite as much as it does in air. All right, anyway, uh, a little bit more about the speed of sound in air, because most of the sounds that we hear in air, um, most of the sounds we hear are traveling through air. So on your equation sheet, I do give you a speed of sound in air. In fact, it's, it's 343 meters per second, but that's not true for all air, right? That's actually only true for like room temperature air, so like 20 degrees Celsius. If we have hotter air, it travels a little faster. If we have slower air, it travels a little slower. And you don't you know, need, to, need to memorize this or anything, but every like degree Celsius we go up, it changes, the speed changes by about a half of a meter per second. So if we have you know, like the air in an oven, that's going to be way faster speed of sound than room temperature air. Um, what else? I felt like there was one other thing I wanted to say about this. Oh, I did. <laughs> Questions about that before we go back to underwater for a minute. All right. Uh, have you ever tried to talk underwater? Yeah. A few of you have. Does it work very well? No. What does it sound like? <laughs> Sam, it just sounds quiet. No, it's really loud. There's no real Oh, it's loud? Well, it's loudish. All right, let me rephrase my question. Have you ever tried to hear somebody else talk underwater? Yeah. yeah. What does it sound like? Yeah, really garbled, right? And probably not very loud either. So, what the heck? If sound travels so much better underwater, what the heck? Will, what's going on? Wow, I think it's a few things. Look at that. Firstly, people can't really move their mouth as well as they would in the, like, above water because they don't want to swallow much water. So, they're, like, not going to open all the way to the everything. Alright, so you don't want to swallow water, okay. Also, I think because in a liquid, like, you get the molecules moving in all different directions and sliding along each other. So okay. that the sound might not be traveling like in a straight line towards the person might just get jostled around the All right. So yes, liquid molecules can slide past one another. Gaseous molecules can do that way better. Uh, so so that I don't think has a piece of our answer in it. Uh, what is make when we talk? Like what is vibrating? What is causing those frequencies to be produced? A contract. Vocal cords, where are they? Yeah, yeah, larynx, right. So your larynx, I guess, is kind of like underneath your thyroid. So, so grab it gently, right? Grab on, like where your thyroid is. Jenny, you too. And and make some sort of sound, right? Talk, hum, like whatever, and feel that vibration. All right, some of you are being a little recalcitrant, but uh, I can feel very clear vibrations when I talk. Uh, and I'm holding near my larynx. If I'm underwater, okay, what's making this? What's make, doing the vibrating underwater if I try and talk? Same thing. Same thing. What is the medium that my larynx is putting that energy into? You just say air, right? And then that air, like, can it, the air outside me is in communication with the air inside me. But if I open up my mouth underwater, unless I want to get water adjacent to my larynx, which I don't, because, I mean, that's not only going to make me swallow, I'm going to, like, drown, it's going to go down my, like, into my respiratory system. Um, unless I'm going to get water there, I'm still putting the energy into air, and then at some point it has to refract into the water, it has to jump from the one medium to the other, and, yeah, that's going to absolutely mess with the sound signal, right? Um, so I think there are a number of reasons that we can't talk very well underwater, yet other sounds, right, can, can travel really effectively. Um, other issues with that. All right, so that's 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 enough. Other questions from you guys about the speed of sound before we move on to our ear parts. All right, we missed a lot of ear parts, but there's a lot of ear parts that actually have nothing to do with with hearing. All right, so here's a diagram, and 
there's a lot of things labeled. Um, let's start from the outside and move in. So the outside actually isn't even labeled on here. Anybody know like what our technical name for that like for the part of the ear you can grab onto is? Ben, what's it called? Uh, oh, I have no idea. I just thought it was called the external ear. And somebody yesterday used a term that I'd never heard in my life for like this part of the ear. I, I don't remember what it was like. Tragus or so? I don't remember. I've never heard of it. Tragus? Yeah, I think that was it. Um, I've never heard of that. But anyway, I think all of this stuff that you can grab onto, and it's safe to grab that part of your ear, uh, is just called the external ear. And does that play a role in hearing or no? No, I think it does. I think it does. So in your foursomes, real quick, can you take 30 seconds and compare what you think the role of the external ear is to hear it? some good sharing. All right, um, because I'm closest to this group, I heard them best. Um, Amanda, what, what came up in your group? That it kind of directs the sound waves Kind of directs the sound waves. I would add an extra word there. I would say that it directs extra energy into our ear. So if you don't have this external part of your ear, you can hear fine, right? But not as much energy is going to enter the, that hole, right? The external ear can help channel some additional energy into, into the hole that wouldn't have, have uh, reached there anyway. Um, my last year of teaching at Monmouth Regional, I had uh, a student that was born with no like external ears, right? And he did have like prosthetic external ears, but they weren't like placed like in the right place. They were kind of placed like further back. So I don't think they were aiding uh, in getting extra energy into his you know, ear hole. Um, and, and I wish I'd, I'd asked him about it, but I think he's sensitive, but I'm sure he's used to people asking about it. I wish I'd, I'd asked him about it. It wasn't in, in physics, so um, you know, we didn't talk about sound at all. All right, so anyway, uh, that's the external ear. Then the first part that's labeled here is, is this. So it's called external auditory canal. And yeah, that's our ear canal that everybody seemed to have heard of before. Um, and really, the, I think the purpose, the, there are two purposes I can think of of the ear canal. I'm only willing to talk about one of them today. Um, I think it's important because we don't want this junk too close to, to, to our outside, right? You don't want to stick stuff in your ear because there's a very real danger. Uh, well, let's, so the next part that, that I'm kind of beating around the bush about is number two. That is our tympanic membrane eardrum, right? So the tympanic membrane is a membrane. So it actually is a very good analogy to think of the drum head, right? So the eardrum is, is kind of like the, the vibrating part of the drum. And if you puncture that, number one, it's really painful, but it's also really hard to repair. So if you puncture that, you can kind of you know, kiss your hearing uh, goodbye from that, from that ear. So if that was all the way out here, you could imagine it would be much easier to, to get something to puncture it. Um, so the, the, I think, really important function of the ear canal is just to keep that way in there. So even if you do like shove your finger in there, which you shouldn't do, right, you're unlikely to come into contact with the eardrum. Um, it's not a good idea to shove like Q-tips in there. Um, you can be careful, but then, you know, what if like, you know, the, the mirror door kind of hits, hits, if you open the mirror door, it hits it, or, you know, you, you, somebody else walks by and it hits the Q-tip, it goes right through the eardrum, bad news. So, uh, so anyway, we got our ear canal, we have our tympanic membrane. The purpose of the tympanic membrane is to be in communication with the, the compressions and rarefactions, like move, moving through the air, and then the air will vibrate the tympanic membrane, right, back and forth. So the eardrum will vibrate in response to the, the energy that's traveling through the air. Um, questions from anybody about up to the, the eardrum? All right. On the back side of the eardrum, right, we have number three. Number three is the first in our series of three bones that Ben alluded to. So we have the malleus, which is also sometimes called the hammer. Right, so the malleus grabs onto the eardrum, and as the eardrum vibrates, that vibrates the malleus also. 
And then we have the next bone called the stapes, or the anvil, right? So the hammer smacks against the, the anvil, the malleus smacks against the incus. Uh, incus, kind of like one of my favorite body parts, because it's like the only thing that rhymes with like pincus, at least in the English language. Uh, so so that, that's how I'm able to keep these names uh, straight a little bit. So anyway, the malleus bangs on the incus, and then the incus is connected to this final bone, which I think Ben called the stirrup, uh, but the technical name for that is the stapes. All right? So these three bones take the vibrations from the eardrum, deliver them to the, to the inside of the, or the, the, what's that called? It's called the, uh, the inner ear. Um, but they do, the, the, their geometry amplifies those vibrations tremendously. Right, so we have way higher amplitude vibrations by the time we get to the end of those three bones than we had at the beginning. Um, on Tuesday, Tuesday, in my engineering class, right, we were missing all of our juniors. We had like three seniors, so we decided to make something for you guys. So I have something for you. Uh, we printed an enlarged model of these three bones. All right, so let me try and, and match this up to that, and then I'll pass it around for you. So uh, the, the malleus is, is this part this part here. I'll pass it around. The incus is this other part here. So it kind of almost looks like a molar, like a tooth, right? The tooth-looking part is the malleus and the incus. And then the stapes is down here. Now, this other junk at the bottom, that's not supposed to be part of the model. Um, when, you, when we printed this, we had to put a raft on the bottom, and then we had to put some support columns on also. So the, this stuff underneath the, uh, the stapes is just like support columns so that we were able to print it. All right, so let me pass this around, but again, you can envision the, the malleus starting the vibrations, and then ultimately those vibrations make it to the end of the stapes. So you can pass that around if you want. All right. What's the what's this like snail looking thing that didn't come up in our list? Was it? Who? The cochlea, right? So this kind of brown snail looking thing is called the cochlea. The cochlea is actually really complicated, and I do have some short videos that I think we will have time to take a look at today. Um, we can see that the stapes is attached to the cochlea. So the stapes is delivering our vibrations, right? To, I think there's something called the round window, there's something else called the oval window, it doesn't matter, right? They're, the vibrations are entering the cochlea. And the cochlea is filled with kind of like two things. It's filled with fluid, and then inside the cochlea, sitting inside that fluid, are little tiny hairs called cilia, I think. So lining like the inside walls of the cochlea are these, these hairs called cilia, and they're all different lengths. Long ones, short ones, ultra short ones. And when we have the vibrations entering the fluid, right, we'll have vibrations in the fluid. And the different length cilia will respond to one particular frequency of vibration that's going through that fluid. So if we have a very high frequency vibration, then these little tiny short ones will start vibrating. If we have low pitch sounds or low frequency vibrations, then these long ones will vibrate. And then, now this is, this is where my knowledge kind of falls off sharply, but also lining the cochlea would be like nerve cells that will convert the vibration of the cilia into electric impulses. What are these yellow things up here? Those yellow things up there? Let me ask a different question. Where do we think those yellow things lead to? The brain, right. What do we call the part of the body that communicates other parts of the body with the brain? Let's call the nervous system. Yeah, I don't know what it's called either. But this yellow stuff is part of the nervous system. So the, the cochlea is producing, a, turning the mechanical vibrations 